Hi there, John McAdams here, and we are going to talk about everything 25 caliber in this episode. The quarter bore section of the ballistics world does not get a lot of love. Certainly not when compared to, say, the smaller 6mm or larger 6.5mm, 270 cal, 7mm, or 30 caliber bore diameters. Even so, those various 25 caliber cartridges have a very rich history and there are some very interesting stories associated with them. So in this episode, I discuss all of the 25 caliber SAMI standardized cartridges, plus a couple of other noteworthy rounds, and I discuss their history, legacy, their strengths and weaknesses, and their recommended uses in detail. Buckle up, folks, because this is going to be a good one. We'll get started with the smallest and least powerful cartridge on the list, and then work our way towards the most powerful. We'll start with the 25 ACP, also known as the 25 Automatic Colt Pistol. Yes, this is a handgun cartridge, but it is still a SAMI certified 25 caliber cartridge, and there are some interesting stories associated with it, and it will also serve as a good base for the rest of this episode moving forward. John Browning developed this cartridge all the way back in 1905. He wanted to make a very, very small, ultra-compact pistol, and he wanted it to be a centerfire cartridge instead of a rimfire cartridge. Well, the 25 ACP ended up being as physically small as you could possibly make a round, yet still fit a primer in it. Now, you see this cartridge compared to darn near anything, and it looks tiny. Browning wanted a very, very small pistol cartridge similar in size to the 22 long rifle, but using a more reliable centerfire platform. Uh, rimfires are better now than they used to be, but still, in general, you're going to have fewer reliability issues with ignition with a centerfire primer compared to a rimfire pistol. Tiny cartridge for a tiny gun. Originally available in the FN model 1905, the Colt Vest pocket pistol followed shortly thereafter. Beretta and Walter also made some very good pistols in the chambering as well. Most notably, the Beretta Model 21 Bobcat series is one of the more notable pistols available in 25 ACP. It has a tip-up barrel in it, so you put a magazine in the grip like you do a normal pistol, but instead of racking the slide like you would a larger pistol, there's a button you push, the barrel will tip up, and you can put a bullet straight into the barrel and then push the barrel back down, lock it in like that. A more unique design you don't really see on anything other than tiny pocket pistols like that. I knew a guy that had one of those pistols in 22 long rifle. He let me shoot it a little bit. My goodness, that pistol was tiny. Very easy to conceal as well. Now, while there were some pretty good pistols in that chambering, there were also lots of terrible, really cheap, really crummy, almost dangerous 25 ACP guns out there too the so-called, quote-unquote, Saturday night specials. So the cartridge kind of got a bad name because of its association with a lot of those really cheap, crummy pistols. It's also just a very small, very low-powered round. Some people call it a little old lady gun because it is physically so small, both the cartridge and the guns it's available in. And it's also just very underpowered. It shoots a small, light bullet at a slow velocity and uses a tiny bit of powder to do that. For instance, in the Hornady Reloading Handbook, it has several different loads, basically for one bullet, a 35 grain XTP. The lightest load uses 0.9 grains of powder, and the heaviest load they have is 1.7 grains of powder. All in all... You're shooting a 35 grain bullet at around 900 feet per second for most of these loads. For instance, you got the Hornady factory load, 35 grain XTP, 900 feet per second. Federal offers it in their punchline, 45 grain bullet at 825 feet per second. Buffalo Bore offers a 60 grain hard cast load at 850 feet per second. There's also a spear gold dot load, 35 grain bullet at 900 feet per second. You're looking at a whopping 60 to 65 foot pounds of muzzle energy with all of those loads. All of those loads are advertised out of a two to two and a half inch long barrel though. Now you may have 
noticed in your mind as you were thinking about that that my goodness like that that load is similar to or maybe even a little bit less powerful than a 22 long rifle loading for instance one of my favorite 22 loads is the federal champion 36 grain copper plated hollow point advertised velocity around 1260 feet per second and i'm actually achieving that out of my rifle so that is a comparison people often make oh my gosh 25 acp it's so short and weak it's like a not even as powerful as a little 22. While that is technically true, remember, I'm getting that much faster velocity for the 22 out of a rifle. You shoot that same 22 long rifle ammo out of a pocket pistol with a two inch long barrel, muzzle velocity is going to be quite a bit slower there too. But in any case, it just shows you that the 25 ACP is operating in the same realm as the 22 long rifle. Not very impressive performance. Many bullets do not get good expansion at those very low muzzle velocities. Penetration can be inconsistent, especially against heavy bone, like a femur, for instance. Still, it is much better than nothing if you need a handgun. And those tiny little pistols can be very effective, very low recoil, very easy to conceal as well. There are lots of wild stories and urban legends out there about this cartridge. Like people say it will fail to penetrate heavy clothing or even bounce off a sheetrock wall. I'm not saying nothing like that has ever happened, but I also think some of those stories are exaggerations. So while you could certainly make an argument that other cartridges may be more effective and in a self-defense role than the 25 ACP, it's not saying you can't kill somebody with it. In fact, this cartridge actually has the dubious distinction of being the primary handgun used in the Katzen Massacre in 1940, where, among other people, the Soviets killed over 7,000 Polish army officers. They basically killed the entire Polish officer corps that they captured. This happened over the course of about a month. One man, Vasily Bloken, who was the NKVD chief executioner, killed nearly all of those men himself, averaging between 200 and 300 a night. Killed all of those people with a German Walter Model 2 and 25 ACP. He used that cartridge and handgun because he wanted something both more reliable and with less recoil than the standard Soviet-issue TT-30 handgun in 30 Tokarev. Without going into all of the grisly details, Bloken used that handgun to kill thousands of men himself, one at a time, via a shot to the base of the skull over the course of 28 days. So don't let anyone tell you the 25 ACP can't be deadly. Switching gears to a more modern and more practical use of the cartridge, I recall Dr. Ignatius Piazza of the Front Sight Firearms Training Institute in Las Vegas had a saying that, quote unquote, any gun will do if you will do when it comes to using a handgun for self-defense. He specifically mentioned cartridges like the 25 ACP would work, but they just had disadvantages compared to other more powerful cartridges. He was right, and like I said earlier, a tiny, easy to conceal, easy to carry handgun and 25 ACP that you have with you when you need it is a darn sight better than your bigger, heavier Glock or 1911 that you left at home if you get into a bind. As we wrap up with the 25 ACP and get ready to move on to the next cartridge, I will close with a quote from the Hornady reloading manual. Hand loading the 25 automatic is not particularly rewarding. The cases and bullets are small and powder charges are minuscule. Use caution since a double charge may not be noticeable until fired. End of quote. So that's the long and short of the 25 ACP. Has some interesting and kind of grisly history associated with it, but it's still in use today, though it seems to have been superseded by the 380 ACP in that really tiny ultra concealable pistol roll. Let's move on to another handgun cartridge, the 25 North American Arms, also known as the 25 NAA. This cartridge was introduced in 1999 by North American Arms for their Guardian Pocket Pistol. The cartridge and pistol were formerly introduced to the world in 2004 at the SHOT Show. This cartridge fills a similar niche to the 25 ACP, but it is quite a bit more powerful. 
This cartridge has a claimed velocity of 1,200 feet per second with a 35 grain Corbon jacketed hollow point out of a 2 inch barrel. So that's like 30% faster than the claim velocity of 25 ACP factory loads. They were able to do this because the 25 ACP is a very small diameter straight wall cartridge. The 25 NAA uses a 32 caliber bottle necked case neck down to 25 caliber. So it's slightly fatter relative to the 25 ACP. So it has a little bit more case capacity. It's a little bit more powerful. Did not really catch on, though. As far as I know, only North American Arms and Corbon made handguns and ammo for it. Neither supports the cartridge anymore as I speak. So they're still floating around out there, and they fill that similar niche. Like I said, never really caught on. And it is a SAMI certified cartridge, but it is basically a dead cartridge right now in 2024. Okay, let's move on to the 2520 Winchester. This is the first rifle cartridge of this episode. While the 25 NAA and 25 ACP both fired .251 caliber bullets, the 2520 fires larger .256 or .257 caliber bullets. And that is a more typical exact bullet diameter for these 25 caliber rifle cartridges. This cartridge was also known as the 6.6 by 33 millimeter R in Europe. The 2520 was released 1892 for the Winchester model 1892 rifle. This was originally developed and released as a black powder cartridge using prevailing nomenclature of the day. This was a 25 caliber bullet pushed by 20 grains of black powder. It is basically a 3220 Winchester round neck down to 25 caliber. Very, very similar in both appearance and performance to the 2525 Marlin that Marlin introduced in the Marlin 1894 rifle. Slightly different bullet nose shape, slightly different seating depth, and of course it has a different head stamp, but the two cartridges are basically identical. Otherwise, this cartridge was, was also different from the 2520 single shot. Winchester wanted a cartridge with performance similar to the 2520 single shot that would fit and function in their new model 1892 lever action repeater. So they designed the 2520 Winchester centerfire to fill that need. The 2520 single shot was a physically longer cartridge that fit in falling block single shot rifles, but not repeaters. Anyway, the 2520 Winchester came around before the 22 Hornet and 218B hit the market. Winchester developed this new 2520 round to fill the niche those rounds ended up taking as a higher velocity, lower recoil, and lower powered varmint round. Though the 2520 Winchester originally started out as a black powder cartridge, it was one of those rounds developed right around the cusp of switching from black powder to smokeless powder. So it was adapted to smokeless powder shortly after it came on the scene. Winchester and Remington both currently produce smokeless loads for the cartridge. Remington makes a load with an 86 grain core lock at 1,460 feet per second. Winchester has an identical load in their PowerPoint line. Both loads have a muzzle energy of 407 foot-pounds. SAMI maximum pressure of 28,000 PSI for both of them, but most factory loads are downloaded to around 20,000 PSI. Hand loads closer to that max pressure can push those bullets a, l a little faster. Hornady lists a 60-grain bullet at up to 2,300 feet per second in their reloading manual. Lyman lists 86 grain loads in excess of 16 to 1700 feet per second in their manual. Even so, this is still a pretty low powered cartridge. Even so, James Jordan used a Winchester 2520 to kill what is now known as the James Jordan buck. That was the world record whitetail deer for 80 years until Milo Hansen killed his buck. And it remained the biggest buck ever killed in the United States until Dustin Huff killed what is now known as the Huff buck in 2021. The story of the James Jordan buck is not exactly a resounding endorsement of the 2520 on a white-tailed deer, though, and he had to shoot that deer several times in order to finally put it down. 
he admits that a lot of his shots were not very good. I'm sure he missed a couple times. I'm sure he hit it a couple of times in less than vital places. But Jordan ended up saying later that he shot every single cartridge that he had on his person to kill that buck back in 1914. And recovering it was quite the adventure. All things considered, I think this is a good varmint round with the lighter 60 grain bullets. It's good for small game with the heavier bullets too. And in a case like that, you won't get a lot of meat loss if you shot something, say, like a rabbit with a heavier 86 grain bullet. And it is going to be much more effective in that role than something like a 22 long rifle is. Despite the fact that this is an older, lower powered cartridge, it's still hanging around. There are still a good number of rifles floating around out there in 2520, and Winchester and Remington, like I said, still make ammo for it too. And as a matter of fact, that Winchester 2520 load was in stock as I was doing my research for this episode. So if you end up with Grandpa's old rifle in 2520, you could go to MidwayUSA.com and buy some 2520 ammo right now. And as long as you keep in mind the limitations of the cartridge and operate within those constraints, it'll work well for you. I wouldn't shoot a deer with it, though, but varmints, small game, have at it. Next, let's talk about the 256 Winchester Magnum. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear the words Winchester Magnum, I think of big, heavy-hitting rifle cartridges like the 300 Win Mag, the 338 Win Mag, and the 458 Win Mag. So you could be forgiven for thinking that's what you would get with the 256 Win Mag. But in actuality, you almost couldn't be more wrong by picturing a cartridge like that. Nope, the 256 Winchester Magnum is a handgun cartridge developed by Winchester for hunting small game and varmints. This was Winchester's response to the 22 Remington Jet. The 256 Winchester Magnum is basically a 357 Magnum cartridge neck down to 25 caliber. It uses the same 257 caliber bullets as most of the other cartridges in this episode. Uh, the 256 Win Mag was announced in 1960, but it wasn't really available in any great numbers until 1962, 1963. Came on the scene first in 1961 in the Ruger Hawkeye pistol. Now, just like the case with the Winchester Magnum moniker, you could be forgiven for picturing a bolt-action rifle when you hear Ruger Hawkeye. But once again, you would be wrong. The original Ruger Hawkeye was a single-shot pistol built on the Ruger Blackhawk revolver frame. But it wasn't a revolver. It was a single-shot handgun that had a swiveling breech block instead of a revolving cylinder. As far as I know, they only made that handgun in 256 Winchester Magnum, and they didn't make very many of them at that. It had an 8.5-inch barrel. More on this in a second. Shoot me an email, john at thebiggamehuntingblog.com, if you or someone you know has a Ruger Hawkeye pistol. That is a very unique handgun. I would like to talk to you about it. I have never even seen one before. Anyway, uh, Marlin adopted the 256 Winchester Magnum for their Model 62 lever action rifle in 1962. And like I said, those guns started coming on the scene in 1963. In addition to the Marlin Model 62 lever action rifle, you could also get this cartridge in the Thompson Center Contender pistol. Since it was available in both handguns and rifles, there were two different sets of ballistics for it. Winchester was the only company to make factory ammo for the cartridge, and it had a quote-unquote standard bullet weight of 60 grains. Looking at a muzzle velocity of about 2,350 feet per second out of an 8.5 inch barrel and about 2,800 feet per second out of a 24 inch long rifle barrel. Now, like I said, 60 grains was standard for factory ammo. Hand loaders can use 75 or 85 grain bullets, though. And you can also take old 357 Magnum cases and modify them to make brass for the 256 Winchester Magnum. This cartridge fills a similar niche as the 2520 Winchester, but the 256 Winchester Magnum has a greater powder capacity and it is loaded to a much higher pressure, 50,000 PSI, according to Sammy Specs. This round did perform well in its intended role, but it quickly faded away. There's not a very big handgun market to begin with, and 
The 256 Winchester Magnum did not have a great reputation for reliability in revolvers due to incompatibility of the high pressure round with the cylinder gap most revolvers had. So that limited it to just single shot pistols. There also just wasn't a lot of differentiation from existing cartridges in the rifle market. So it, like I said, just kind of faded away. The folks at Hornady actually said in their reloading manual that this cartridge is perhaps most notable for the speed with which it flopped. Ruger discontinued their Hawkeye pistol in 1966. Marlin did the same thing with their Model 62 rifle shortly thereafter. Winchester no longer makes factory loads for this cartridge either. So if you have one, you need to hand load for it. Now let's talk about the next cartridge, the 2535 Winchester. And we'll also talk about the very similar 2536 Marlin. Now we are starting to get somewhere with these cartridges. The 2535 Winchester was released in 1895 in conjunction with the 3030 Winchester. Now the 2535, along with the 3030, is one of the very first American cartridges designed from the start to use smokeless powder. This cartridge is a close relative to the 3030. In fact, it's basically just a 30-30 neck down to shoot 25 caliber projectiles. Now, the 2535 is much more powerful than the old 2520, though, because it has so much more case capacity. And being designed from the start to use smokeless powder, it's also a higher pressure cartridge. 44,000 PSI SAMI maximum average pressure for the 2535. Though it is a lot more powerful than the old 2520, the 3030 is more powerful than the 2535, though. Now, since the 2535 is descended from the 3030, it has a rim case, just like the 3030, primarily intended for use in lever action rifles. According to Phil Sharp in his book, The Rifle in America, the original loading for the 2535 was a 117 grain bullet at 1,910 feet per second. He also said that Winchester stepped that load up to a 117 grain bullet at 2,375 feet per second. Jack O'Connor lists a 117 grain bullet at 2,280 feet per second in his book, The Big Game Rifle. There was a higher velocity 87 grain load for the cartridge for a short time, say around 2,700 feet per second muzzle velocity, but that load did not hang around for long. Winchester currently offers one factory load for this round as I speak, 117 grain bullet at 2,230 feet per second. That is just short of 1,300 foot-pounds of energy. Hornady offers it in their Lever Evolution line of ammo with a 110 grain FTX at 2,425 feet per second for 1,436 foot-pounds of energy. Winchester actually still lists this cartridge in their Model 94 Lever Action Rifle 2 with either a 20-inch or a 24-inch long barrel. Now, all those crazy different ammo specs I just listed probably cover the spectrum of velocities you would get out of those different barrel lengths. I'll bet that 2,375 foot per second velocity was from a 26 inch long barrel. Phil Sharp was probably correct that that slower muzzle velocity of 1910 feet per second was the initial ballistics of the cartridge but they probably realized they could step it up a little bit to those faster velocities in the 23 to 2400 foot per second range safely. And it also made the cartridge look more impressive and easier to sell to people. Regardless of the exact ballistics we are talking about, the 2535 is generally right in the area of where a lot of people think a good deer cartridge starts. They would say that it is adequate for deer and that things get better as you move towards things that are more powerful. I'm going to read an excerpt from Jack O'Connor's book, The Big Game Rifle, for you. Remember, this is Jack O'Connor talking here, not me. I quote, For many years it has been said that the two lightest cartridges that should be used on whitetail in the woods are the 25 Remington and the 2535 Winchester. In ballistics, the two cartridges are practically identical as both use the 117 grain bullet driven at 2,300 feet per second in the 25 Remington and at 2,280 feet per second in the 2535. 
muzzle energy runs around 1,375 foot-pounds in the case of the 25 Remington and 1,350 in the case of the 2535. Many states have written these ballistics into law by making it illegal to hunt deer with a cartridge giving less than 1,000 foot-pounds of energy at 100 yards. End of quote. So as I read that, it sounds to me like the 2535 and the 25 Remington were basically the smallest and least powerful cartridges that seemed to deliver acceptable results on deer size game most of the time. With that in mind, it appears like those writing game laws back then took that into consideration and then they drew a line right underneath both cartridges and said that was the minimum. So no, there's nothing magical about 1,000 foot-pounds of energy or 1,500 foot-pounds of energy or anything like that. You can cleanly kill game with less energy than that, and likewise, you can hit something with more energy than that and not cleanly kill it. It just seems like they made what they thought was a reasonable legal minimum based upon anecdotal performance of the cartridges in somewhat common use in the early 20th century, and then those requirements have stuck around for the past century in some places, even though we have experienced a massive improvement in rifle, cartridge, and bullet technology since then. For instance, that is still the case in Colorado. I'll read you an excerpt from their hunting laws. Must be a minimum of 24 caliber, must use expanding bullets that weigh a minimum of 70 grains for deer, pronghorn, and bear, 85 grains for elk and moose, and have an impact energy at 100 yards of 1,000 foot-pounds as rated by the manufacturer. And even in cases where that is not a hard legal minimum, that 1,000 foot-pounds of energy still gets thrown around a lot. Oh man, you know, this cartridge falls below 1,000 foot-pounds of energy at this range, or it starts out with less energy than that, blah, blah, blah. It sure does sound like this is where that number came from. Back to the 2535. It seems like this cartridge delivered adequate, but not necessarily earth-shaking performance on medium game. Now, as you might expect from him, Elmer Keith was not a fan of the cartridge, and he talked about experiencing terrible performance on deer and even a coyote with the round. Not everyone shared his opinion on the cartridge, so take that for what you will. People have used the 2535 to take a lot of deer over the years, though people have also used it on stuff like moose, antelope, and elk. It will work on those bigger animals like elk and moose, getting close, slip that bullet into the vitals. Funny enough, a 117 grain 25 caliber bullet has a sectional density of 0.253. That's higher than 0.226 for a 150 grain 30 cal bullet and nearly identical to the 0.256 sectional density of the 170 grain 30 caliber bullet the 3030 sometimes uses. These bullets aren't going very fast, so it has an arcing trajectory not well suited for longer range shots, but the fact that it has such a mild velocity probably means it penetrates surprisingly well too, even with very simple cup and core bullets. The 2535 is also a mild recoiling round. I ran the numbers, and when you shoot them all from 7 pound rifles, the 2535 has a little bit more than half the recoil energy of the 3030 and the 243, both of which are very mild recoiling themselves. And the 2535 also had the advantage of being available in the relatively lightweight, inexpensive, and easy to find Model 94 lever action rifle. Also available in the Savage Model 99, the Winchester 1885 single shot, the Winchester Model 55 and 64 lever action rifles. It was also available in some different European combination guns under the designation 6.5 by 52 millimeter R. Now there are a couple of common complaints I hear from hunters and shooters today about the industry. The first is the complaint that Companies hype up their products too much. Well, here is another quote from the Rifle in America by Phil Sharp talking about the 2535 in the section about it. I quote, Winchester recommends its accuracy at 700 yards, but this author would like to see any reasonable sized group shot with a rifle in the lever action class using this cartridge at one half that range. End of quote. Say what you will about gun and ammo companies hyping their products today. Nobody is saying anything nearly that ridiculous. 
Complain all you want about companies marketing their products today. Seems like they are actually a lot better now than used to be the case. Now, there's another complaint I hear often about the gun and ammo industry today, and this will actually segue us into the next cartridge. Anytime a company introduces a new cartridge today, there's a chorus of people that always say the same thing. Quote, unquote, we don't need any new cartridges. Everything we have is plenty. You're just trying to sell us new stuff. This new stuff doesn't actually do anything that my old fill-in-the-blank cartridge doesn't already do. Once again, things are better on that front than they used to be. I mentioned earlier the 2536 Marlin was almost identical to the 2535 Winchester. Back then, different manufacturers would build cartridges with almost identical ballistics to cartridges their competitors make, but have them set up so they would only work in their rifles. That was the case with the 2536 Marlin. Identical ballistics to the 2535 Winchester, but it would only work in Marlin rifles. The same was also true. You could not shoot the 2535 Winchester in a Marlin rifle. Well, Remington did the same thing too with their 25 Remington cartridge. And while the Marlin and Winchester rounds were both rimmed cartridges designed for use in a lever action rifle. The 25 Remington was a rimless cartridge. We're not going to talk about this cartridge in great detail. I only mention it because its performance is so similar to the 2535 and because Jack O'Connor mentioned it in that quote I just read you and because I also have a personal history with this round too. Remington developed this cartridge in the early 20th century, and like I mentioned, it was a rimless cartridge that worked better in bolt-action, pump-action, and auto-loading rifles than the rimmed 2535. Like I mentioned, released in the early 1900s, 1906 is thrown out there sometimes as a date of introduction, but regardless of the details, Remington introduced this round for their auto-loading Model 8 rifle. It was also available in the Model 14 slide action, the Remington Model 30 bolt action. Other companies made uh, rifles in this chambering too, like Stevens. But Remington made a whole series of cartridges for the new Model 8 and eventually Model 81 auto-loading rifles. 25 Remington, 30 Remington, 32 Remington, 35 Remington. Those cartridges have very similar performance to the 2535, 3030, and 32 Winchester cartridges. Savage was similar with the 303 Savage basically being their take on the 3030. But we're talking about the 25 Remington, and like I mentioned, almost identical to the 2535 Winchester in terms of ballistic performance. Now, at one time, my dad had Model 8 rifles in all four available chamberings. I shot several animals, including my biggest deer with a 32 Remington. I took a couple of others and a couple of hogs with a 35 Remington. I never killed anything with a 25 or a 30 Remington, though. I don't think he did either, though we both shot those cartridges quite a bit while we had those rifles. Of those four, the 35 Remington is still around today, but the 25, 30, and 32 are all basically completely obsolete. You can hand load for them, though, and funny enough, Hornady specifically says in their reloading manual that you can use 25, 35 Winchester load data to reload for the 25 Remington, too. So like I said, as frustrating as the new cartridge situation may be to some people today, once again, a lot better than used to be the case. It's not like Winchester is rolling out their version of the 6.5 Creedmoor, but having it only function in Winchester rifles and designing those rifles in turn that you can't use Hornady 6.5 Creedmoor ammo in them. That would be really annoying. Up next is the 250 Savage, also known as the 250 3000 Savage. This cartridge came on the scene in 1915, and it was one of the very first speed demons of the 20th century. Charles Newton designed this round to fit in a Savage Model 99 lever action rifle, which, since it used a rotary magazine instead of a tubular magazine, could use pointed bullets. Now, the 250 Savage uses basically a shortened 30 6 case neck down to 25 caliber. We will see a similar formula of a 25 caliber cartridge with a 30 6 parent case again later in this episode. Anyway, Newton's original load was a 100 grain bullet at 2,800 feet per second. But the marketing folks at Savage modified the design and lowered bullet weight to 87 grains in order to get a faster muzzle velocity that crossed the 3,000 foot per second barrier. 
That made it the fastest commercially produced cartridge in the world at the time. That is where the original name 250 3000 Savage came from. Obviously, that generated a lot of hype and desire for this new round, but Newton himself was said to be unhappy with that choice from a practical perspective because he thought, and was probably correct in thinking this way, that a 100-grain bullet at 2,800 feet per second was better suited for use on larger animals, like deer, than that lighter and faster 87-grain bullet. That 87-grain bullet worked great with lightning-fast kills on game sometimes, when it worked right, but it also suffered from some bullet failures on bigger game too. Remember, this cartridge came out in 1915. Bullet technology was very basic then. There was no such thing as a monolithic, a bonded, or any other premium controlled expansion bullet, and we are dealing with very simple, thin-jacketed, cup-and-core bullets. And yes, sometimes if you shoot a deer or especially an elk or something like that straight on the shoulder with one of those lightweight, lightly constructed, high velocity, 87 grain bullets, you might get excessive expansion and very little penetration. But in cases where that lightweight, high velocity bullet made it into the body cavity, it could make a mess out of the vitals of that animal and kill it very quickly. The problem was the inconsistency, though. And sometimes those bullets would behave in unexpected ways. Fortunately, bullet technology did evolve. And some manufacturers started to appreciate that heavier 100-grain loading. All in all, I think this is an excellent round for deer size game with a simple 100-grain cup-and-core bullet. I personally think the 87-grain bullet was better suited for varmints. 87 grain factory loads eventually fell by the wayside, and the cartridge is now officially known as the 250 Savage. So, eventually, some other people came along to my way of thinking and Charles Newton's way of thinking about this cartridge. Of everything we have talked about to this point, the 250 Savage was the first really popular rifle cartridge, and it was one of the golden boys of the early 20th century. Not only was it available in the Savage Model 99, but Winchester made it in their Model 54 rifle and their Model 70 rifle. Remington made it in their Model 30 bolt action. Funny enough, the 250 Savage was actually the third most popular caliber in the Model 54 behind the 30 6 and 270, according to my Winchester handbook. The 257 Roberts took market share away from the 250 Savage in 1934. Don't worry, we'll talk about the 257 Roberts later. And things got worse for the 250 Savage after the various 6mm cartridges started coming on the scene in the 1950s and 60s. For instance, uh, 243 achieves that 3,000 foot per second velocity easily with a 100 grain bullet, and it can push an 87 grain bullet even faster. And that cartridge is also very small, doesn't recoil very much, those sort of things. The 250 Savage has the same 0.473 inch rim diameter as the 308 and the 30 6 family of cartridges. But since the Savage 99 is a physically smaller rifle than, say, a Remington Model 700 or a Winchester Model 70 short action, the Savage cartridges have a shorter overall length than classic quote unquote short action cartridges, like the 243, 308, 65 Creedmoor. For instance, the 250 Savage has a maximum overall length of 2.515 inches. The 300 Savage has a maximum overall length of 2.6 inches. Compare that to 2.7 inches for the 243, 2.81 inches for the 308, 2.825 inches for the 6.5 Creedmoor. Plus, the Savage rounds have a lower SAMI maximum pressure as well. So this means that those rounds just simply have a lower ceiling on their performance than those larger and more modern rounds, like the 243 and the 308. Even so, the Savage rounds still work just fine under the right circumstances. In fact, if you wanted an effective yet light recoiling deer rifle with a little bit of extra class and history associated with it, you could do a lot worse than a 250 Savage. And that cartridge will also work very well in a crossover roll. Load it with lighter, say, 75 grain or 85, 87 grain bullets. And it is a very effective varmint cartridge as well with velocities over 3,000 feet per second possible with those lighter weight bullets. It's not going as fast as some of the other quote-unquote varmint cartridges out there, but it will still work. 
For those reasons, the 250 Savage is still hanging around. The Savage Model 99 is no longer in production, but they made lots of rifles in that chambering, and you can still find them on the secondary market. Sammy Spec is 1 in 14 inch rifling twist rate. It worked great with 87 grain and even 100 grain bullets, but not so much the heavier 117 grain bullets. But fortunately, the later production Savage 99s had a faster 1 in 10 inch twist rate, though, and you could even go up to that 117 grain bullet just fine with those. So you can use everything from, say, 75 grain up to 117 grain bullets with them in a hand load. Now, the Savage 99 was always the main rifle in that chambering. There were way more Savage 99s made in 250 Savage than any other rifle, but you can still sometimes find some of the old Winchesters and Remingtons hanging around too, but there's just not nearly as many of them. Hornady and Remington both make 250 Savage factory ammo right now. You can get a load from Remington with a 100 grain core lock at 2,820 feet per second, or from Hornady... 100 grain interlock at 2,800 feet per second, both around 1,750 foot-pounds of energy. And so this is another one of those not only classy and effective varmint deer and possibly even bigger game cartridges. This cartridge also has a pretty mild recoil, so it is another option. If you have Grandpa's old Savage 99 or something lying around and you have a more recoil shy or just smaller shooter that you want to get into hunting, well, 250 Savage might be a good choice for you. Okay, now we'll talk about the 2545 Sharps. This is a newer cartridge from the Sharps Rifle Company. This is not to be confused with Shiloh Sharps, which makes replicas of old Sharps Buffalo rifles. Now, CEO Michael Blank developed the 2545 to be yet another quote unquote improvement on the 223 and 556 cartridges that still functions well in the AR 15. As I have discussed before, cartridges have to fit within some pretty strict pressure and size limitations to safely and reliably work in the rifle. So it is tough to make cartridges that fit those requirements that also dramatically improve upon the old 223 and 556. In this case of the 2545, we have literally a 223 case necked up to 25 caliber. That is also how the cartridge got its name. It is a 25 caliber cartridge with a case 45 millimeters long, just like the 223 Remington and the 556 NATO. This is a slightly different nomenclature than we commonly see, though. A cartridge name with a hyphen in it, like the 2545 Sharps, normally denotes the caliber of the bullet and the powder charge it uses like the 3030, 2520, 2535, etc. Cartridges with an X in their name usually use a metric naming convention and typically state the caliber of the bullet and the length of the case, like the 5.56 by 45 millimeter or the 7.62 by 39 or 51. So the 2545 Sharps is a little unconventional in that way. But that's the deal with it, and that's where the name comes from. Like the 300 Blackout, since the 2545 is dimensionally so similar to the 223, the 2545 Sharps works with a standard AR bolt, bolt carrier, and magazine. You just need a new barrel to convert a 5.56 chamber for an AR into a 2545. As far as I know, the Sharps Rifle Company is the only source of factory ammo, and they currently offer two 2545 loads, an 87 grain spear hot core at 3,000 feet per second, and a 75 grain V Max going a little faster. Now, the good news is that 87 grain bullet is actually in stock as I record this. Now, 87 grain bullet at 3,000 feet per second, where have I heard that before? Oh, yeah, that's basically like the old performance of the 250 Savage. So, here you have a cartridge that gives you 250 Savage performance from an AR 15. For those keeping track, that is similar performance to the 6.5 Grendel. The 6.5 Grendel shoots a little bit larger diameter, heavier bullet, a little bit slower. You're looking at, say, a 123 grain bullet at around 2,500 feet per second instead of 87 grains at 3,000. But the thing with the 6.5 Grendel is you need a new bolt face and a magazine, while the 2545 does not require those things. As far as I know, the Sharps Rifle Company is also the only source of 2545 rifles. 
but in addition to selling complete rifles, they also sell complete upper receivers in 2545 as well. At this instant, they list 16 inch, 18 inch, 20 inch, and 24 inch barrel links on their website. And it is very simple to buy a new upper receiver, swap out your old 556 upper with that new 2545 upper, and then you're ready to go if that floats your boat. The cartridge does not seem to be super popular. I'm guessing that's just because it probably doesn't offer enough performance to set it apart from other more popular rounds in the AR-15. And there's also, you get one of these feedback loops going here too, where there's not a lot of companies that offer rifles and ammo for it. So it doesn't really become popular, but it doesn't become popular because there's not a lot of rifle and ammo options for it. Uh, but I will say though, that those that have a 2545 seem to really like them. So if you're an AR kind of guy, this might be worth looking into. Okay, now let's talk about the 257 Roberts, also known as the 257 Bob. This round started out as a Wildcat cartridge derived from the 7mm Mauser that a guy named Major Ned Roberts developed in the 1920s. Smokeless powder options were pretty limited back then, and the 30 6 case was just too overbore for ideal performance with a 25 caliber bullet at the time, though its day would come, and we'll talk about that shortly. That cartridge size worked well with 30 caliber bullets and even 277 caliber bullets, but 25 caliber was just a bridge too far in the 1920s and 30s when you're talking about use with a full size. 30-06 case. If you shorten that 30-06 case a little bit and reduce the case volume, then that actually turned out to be a better match with the powders they had available at the time, which is what they did with the 250 Savage. Well, Major Ned Roberts did a similar thing with the 7x57 millimeter Mauser case. The full-size 7 millimeter Mauser case was a little bit longer than the 250 Savage case, but a little bit shorter than the 30-06 case. And it turned out that that case volume was more suitable for use with powders available at the time in a 25 caliber board than the full length 30 out six case. Well, Major Roberts found a winner with this combination. Remington picked up his design, made some slight modifications to it, and then released it to the world as the 257 Roberts in 1934. So here are the original ballistics for the cartridge for three different loads initially introduced with the round in the 1930s, according to Phil Sharp from his book, The Rifle in America. An 87-grain bullet at 3,200 feet per second, a 100-grain bullet at 2,900 feet per second, and a 117-grain bullet at 2,650 feet per second. So as you can see, the cartridge provides a modest improvement over the 250 Savage with a 100-grain bullet, but a more substantial 200 foot per second jump in performance with an 87-grain bullet. Since the 257 Roberts is part of the 7mm Mauser family, and by extension the 30 6 and 308 families, the 257 Roberts has the same 0.473 inch rim diameter as the 30 6 270, 308, 243, etc. Maximum overall length is 2.78 inches for the round, so it's just a little bit shorter overall than the 308. These reasons, combined with the fact that its dimensions worked well with a number of popular bolt-action rifles, meant that the 257 Roberts was a pretty big hit from the start. Those lighter, higher-velocity bullets worked well on woodchucks and coyotes at a little bit longer range, and those heavier bullets still had a reasonable trajectory and darn effective terminal performance on deer and antelope as well. And the cartridge also doesn't recoil much at all either. One of my grandfather's neighbors had a 257 Roberts for his 10-year-old son. That kid killed a bunch of deer and hogs with that rifle. Now, especially in those days shortly after it came on the scene, some people described the 257 Roberts as the most useful cartridge ever developed. Because remember, this was in the days before the 243 and the 6mm Remington. So in terms of quote-unquote crossover rounds that were well-suited for use, say, on varmints and small predators on one end of the spectrum, and also effective on bigger game like deer and maybe even bigger stuff on the other end of the spectrum, the 257 Roberts was about it. You could throw the 250 Savage in there a little bit as well, but the 257 Roberts definitely outperformed it in both of those areas. In fact, Ammo companies have since come out with some quote-unquote plus P loads for the cartridge as well. 
In fact, Sammy currently has two separate loads for the 257 Roberts. The original load with a 54,000 PSI max average pressure and a newer 257 Roberts plus P designation with a 58,000 PSI Sammy max pressure. This is the only rifle cartridge with an official Sammy plus P designation too. So this cartridge is capable of even more impressive performance with modern rifles and modern ammunition. So here are some examples. At this instant, Remington offers a regular 257 Roberts factory load, 117 grain core lock, 2650 feet per second. That is not plus P ammo. That's regular 257 Roberts ammo. So if you get Grandpa's old 257 Roberts made in the 1930s or something like that, that ammo is safe to use in it. But if you have a more modern production rifle, you can use, say, this Winchester plus P load, 117 grain power point at 2,780 feet per second. Nosler also has a plus P load with a 110 grain Acubond at 3,050 feet per second. Hornady also has a plus P load in their Superformance line of a 117 grain SST, 2,946 feet per second. This is also another one of those cartridges that hand loaders can certainly improve on the original specs of it if you're using a rifle with a strong action. I won't go into details here, but there are some very impressive hand load recipes and a couple different load manuals I have. Now, Remington originally rolled out this cartridge in their Model 30 rifle. Winchester also picked it up in 1935 in their Model 54 rifle. They also offered it in their Model 70 rifle. It was number six in popularity in their pre-World War II Model 70s, behind the 30-06, 270, 22 Hornet, 220 Swift, and 300 H&H. Uh, among other models, you could also get it in the Remington 722, the Model 7, and Model 700 bolt-action rifles at various times. Same thing with their 760 pump. Ruger made it in their number one single shot, the Ruger Hawkeye Browning A-Bolt over the years as well. Like I said, pretty popular round, and it took a big market share from the 250 Savage when it came on the scene. Unfortunately for the 257 Roberts, the various 6mm, like the 6mm Remington, and especially the 243 Winchester, also took a big market share away from it in the 1950s and 1960s. This round is still hanging around, though, and guys that have 257 Roberts rifles love them. And let's be clear here, too. Though there may be, quote-unquote, more popular alternatives to the 257 that also may perform, quote-unquote, better in one area or another, for the tasks that round was best for, the 257 Roberts works as well or even better in those roles today as it did many years ago. Similar to the 250 Savage, this is another classy and effective hunting cartridge that gets the job done with a minimum of fuss and recoil. I want to take a quick aside here and discuss an interesting Wildcat cartridge birthed from the 257 Roberts. It's called the 65257. There were lots of Japanese Arasaka rifles that found their way into the USA at the end of World War II. Now, the Japanese Army and Navy primarily used two different rifles in two different cartridges during the war. The first was the Type 38 rifle in 6.5 by 50 millimeter SR. The second was the Type 99 and 7.7 by 58 millimeter. Naturally, those who ended up with those rifles wanted to shoot them, but actual 6.5 millimeter Japanese ammo was darn near impossible to find at the time. The same was also true with the 7.7 millimeter ammo, but for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to focus on the 6.5 millimeter ammo. Things are different now, but a guy in the 1950s, 60s, or 70s needed help finding ammo to shoot in those rifles. So American gunsmiths came up with an innovative solution to that problem. Somebody realized that the 257 Roberts cartridge was similar in size to the 6.5 millimeter Japanese round, and it was actually, in fact, a little bit longer. So someone came up with the idea to take a chamber reamer to the 6.5 millimeter Type 38 rifles and lengthen the chamber a tiny bit. Then they could resize 257 Roberts cases to shoot 6.5 millimeter bullets. 
And voila, you have a new cartridge called the 6.5x257 that would safely function in those thousands of Japanese rifles and would work darn well for hunting medium game. You would need to hand load, but the process of reaming out the chamber and making some custom loads was a much simpler and more straightforward process than getting actual 65 by 50 millimeter SR ammo at the time. In fact, my dad shot his first deer with one of those converted rifles as a young man, and we actually still have that exact rifle to this day. I want to say he used a hand load consisting of something like a 120 grain Sierra bullet at around 2,600 feet per second. This was also back in the day before he had easy access to a chronograph, so he admits that they were just guessing with the velocity. And I'm sure what happened was wherever they got their data, they said, okay, you put this much powder in behind this bullet and you'll get that velocity. And they did, and that's what they thought they were getting. So who knows what sort of velocity they were actually getting but that's probably in the ballpark, 120 grain bullet at about 2,600 feet per second. Now, likewise, a bunch of surplus 8 millimeter Mauser rifles made their way into the USA after the war as well. Gunsmiths took some similar steps to adopt those rifles to a cartridge we now call the 8 millimeter aught 6. This is just like the name says, a 30 aught 6 resized to shoot 8 millimeter projectiles. In both cases, It's a pretty simple job. You can use the same rifle without substantial modifications, aside from reaming reaming out the chamber. And it's also much easier to source brass and component bullets to make some darn effective hand loads in each case. Okay, so that is the deal with the 257 Roberts and the 6.5 by 257. Let's move on to the next cartridge. The 25-06 Remington. Just like the name says, the 25-06 is a 30-06 neck down to shoot 25 caliber bullets. It started off as a Wildcat developed by A.O. Needner in 1920, but just like I teased a couple times in this episode, the new 25 caliber cartridge was far too overbore and could not reach its full potential with the powders available at the time. For that reason, the 25 Needner never really caught on. However, the introduction of slower-burning powders like IMR-4350 and H-4831, which was originally obtained from surplus 20mm Orlikon shells after World War II, changed the game completely and allowed handloaders to maximize the performance of the 25 Needner. In fact, the purchase and resale of surplus U.S. government powder, both from the aforementioned Orlikon shells and other sources, is how Hodgen powder got started. Those slower burning powders completely transformed the 25-06 and made it into a much more effective round. Designers at Remington knew a good thing when they saw it, and the company standardized the cartridge as the 25-06 Remington in 1969. The company started manufacturing the Remington Model 700 rifle in 25-06 and rolled out two factory loads that same year. An 87 grain bullet at a blazing fast velocity of 3,500 feet per second, and a 120 grain load at 3,220 feet per second. As you can imagine, deer and antelope hunters in particular love the accuracy, high velocity, flat trajectory, modest recoil, and impressive performance of the new cartridge with those heavier bullets on medium game in North America. Likewise, the cartridge also worked great as an outstanding varmint round when using those lighter bullets. In fact, if 3,500 feet per second with an 87 grain bullet isn't fast enough for you, you could hand load something else like, say, a 75 grain VMAX at over 3,700 feet per second in cases. Talk about something that will vaporize a prairie dog as well as being death on coyotes. Probably not very fur friendly, but still a very versatile choice for a guy who has a 25 aught 6 and wants to do all sorts of hunting with it. Now, the 25 aught 6 is far and away the most popular cartridge out of everything I'll talk about in this episode. Darn near every company you can think of makes 25 aught 6 ammo. I'm not going to list every single 25 aught 6 factory load here, but I'll give you a couple of examples to demonstrate what is available. For instance, Barnes makes a load with a 100 grain TTSX at 3,225 feet per second. Federal has a load in their power shock line with a 117 grain bullet at 3,030 feet per second. Hornady has a load in their precision hunter line with a 110 grain ELDX 
at 3,140 feet per second. Nosler has a load with a 100 grain partition at 3,300 feet per second. Remington has two different core lock loads, a 100 grain and a 120 grain, at 3,230 and 2,990 feet per second. Winchester also makes a load with a 115 grain ballistic silver tip at 3,060 feet per second. Winchester currently makes their Model 70 in the cartridge. You can get the Browning X-Bolt and Browning Automatic Rifle in the cartridge. Same with the Remington 700, the Ruger American, Savage 110 and Axis, the Mossberg Patriot, and the Weatherby Vanguard. Those are all 25-06 rifles in current production. Now, I personally think the 25-06 is a fantastic open country deer and antelope cartridge. Lighter, higher velocity rounds give a very flat trajectory and excellent results on medium game that size. In fact, even as recently as the early 2000s, this was the cartridge gun riders like Ron Spomer and Craig Boddington advocated for pronghorn in particular. Not that you couldn't use it on bigger game like elk, and plenty of people do that with success, but I just personally think it's most at home on deer and pronghorn. Something like that 100 grain TTSX or partition would be deadly on elk though. With a 200 yard zero, both of those loads have 6 inches or less drop out to 300 yards. Nosler also makes 115 and 120 grain partitions that should also work really well for hand loaders too. In fact, I would prefer to use either of those bullets out of the 25-06 than that 100 grain partition factory load. But you have to hand load with those though. And it looks like you could potentially get in excess of 3,000 feet per second for both that 115 and 120 grain partition in each case. Should be awesome, awesome bullets for use on elk moose, that sort of thing. Not quite as flat of a trajectory as the lighter bullets, but still really good though. Flinging a 120 grain bullet at 3,000 feet per second, that's excellent performance. That's still a really flat shooting round, especially with uh, ballistic turrets and good laser range finders and whatnot. These days, for me personally, if I was hunting elk with this cartridge, like that 120 grain partition would be awesome and it would work out to just about any range I'd feel that I would reasonably shoot an elk at with a 25-06. Anyway, now the Achilles heel of the 25-06 is its rifling twist, though. Sammy spec is 1 in 10. That's what basically every current production rifle has. That twist is unfortunately not fast enough to stabilize bullets heavier than about 120 grains or bullets with a really sleek profile heavier than about 110 grains. For that reason, major bullet manufacturers have not invested a lot of time developing heavy for caliber high BC 257 caliber bullets. Hornady's 25 caliber 110 grain ELDX they use in their Precision Hunter line has a .465 G1BC. That's about as good as it gets for that chambering in a factory load. Nosler does offer that 110 grain Acubon with a .418 BC. It's also pretty good, but not quite as good as the ELDX. Berger has a 115 grain VLD hunting bullet. They say works in a 1 in 10 inch twist with a .483 BC, but you have to hand load it. I don't think that bullet is available in any factory loads right now. Nosler does not currently make a 25 caliber Acubon long range bullet at all. Barnes does not make a 25 caliber LRX bullet at all either. Berger does make a 25 cal 133 grain elite hunter bullet though. 0.613 BC, and they make a 135 grain long range hybrid target bullet with a 0.65 BC. Both require a faster 1 in 8 twist rate, though. We'll talk more about this at the end of the episode, but just realize that as flat shooting as the 25 odd 6 is, it does fall a little short in the wind deflection category. It doesn't perform terrible in this area. After all, it's still a really high velocity round. But just for comparison, the 6.5 Creedmoor Precision Hunter load with the 143 grain ELDX has about 12% less wind deflection than the 25-06 at 500 yards, even when the 25-06 is using that high BC 110 grain ELDX bullet. The faster 6.5 PRC with that same 143 grain ELDX has nearly 25% less wind deflection than the 25-06. And remember, that's with the quote-unquote best 25-06 load here in terms of wind. 
using something like a Remington core lock will hamstring the 25-06 even more in that area. Not necessarily a deal breaker, not trying to throw shade on the cartridge, but keep that in mind if you're going on an open country hunt in a place like Wyoming where it is usually windy. That's not necessarily a reason to go junk your 25-06 and go buy something new, but the situation is different for people that don't already have a 25-06. That is part of the reason why more and more people are switching to the 6.5 millimeter bore diameter these days. That's not to say the 25-06 is a bad choice or it is getting worse in any way. It is as good as it ever was, probably even better. It's just that there are some newer alternatives that outperform it in some key areas like that. We'll talk more about bullets and twist rate here in a minute after these next couple of cartridges. Let's fast forward from 1969 when the 25-06 came on the scene and go all the way to 2004 to talk about the newest cartridge on this list, the 25 Winchester Super Short Magnum, also known as the 25 WSSM. Just like the name says, this is a very short cartridge, overall length of just 2.35 inches. I'm not going to say the 25 Winchester Super Short Magnum is literally a shortened and neck down 404 Jeffrey, but it has a lot in common with the old 404, though, with that fat, beltless case design. Now, the funny thing is, this cartridge achieves performance nearly identical to the 25 out 6, but it does so in a much shorter package and uses less powder in the process. So we have a situation where the cartridge is a little bit more efficient and it delivers essentially the same performance as the old 25 out 6 in a shorter action rifle and with less recoil. Winchester is the only company that makes factory loads for this round right now. They have a load with an 85 grain ballistic silver tip at 3,470 feet per second and a 120 grain power point at 2,990 feet per second. In each case, Winchester also manufactures a 25-06 load with literally identical advertised performance. So what's the deal with the 25W SSM? Why isn't this round more popular? It's giving you literally 25-06 performance out of a cartridge that's basically an inch shorter. Well, there was some patent drama with this cartridge, and this was actually the same issue that affected all of the Winchester Short Magnum and Winchester Super Short Magnum cartridges. So the 270 7mm 300 and 325 WSM, as well as the 223, 243, and 25 WSSM. Long story short, a guy named Rick Jameson managed to get a patent on a quote-unquote short, fat cartridge design. And that is what all of those cartridges I just mentioned use. Patents are unusual in the firearms industry, and this is the only case where I'm aware of where someone was able to patent a design like that. In any case, he did somehow and was trying to work out a deal with Winchester and with other companies where he would license production of these cartridges to them and they would pay him royalties for all of the ammunition and all of the rifles that they produced in those rounds. Now, this is one of those subjects that it is really hard to get good information about. There's a lot of rumor and innuendo out there about this drama, but Rick and the folks at Winchester are the only ones that know for certain because they came up with some sort of an agreement, the details of which were confidential. But what ended up happening was Winchester and Browning started producing rifles in these cartridges. Presumably, he got some sort of royalty from it. But that was also incentive for other companies like Hornady, Nosler, and Remington not to pick up those cartridges because they did not want to pay him royalties. Now, as far as I know, Winchester and Browning were the only companies that ever made rifles in 25 WSSM. As far as I know, this patent has since expired, which is why you see other companies making rifles and ammunition for for some of the other cartridges, like the 300 WSM is the most popular of that whole group. That's why I say, for instance, Hornady makes ammo for it now. They did not for a long time, and they actually developed the 300 Ruger Compact Magnum in partnership with the folks at Ruger to 
have a cartridge that was giving similar performance to the 300 Winchester short magnum without having to pay Rick Jamison royalties on it. Anyway, that's a long way of saying the 25 WSSM was almost strangled in its crib. I'm not sure how popular this cartridge would have been on its own, though. It's in that middle ground where it's just a touch too long for use in an AR-15, and it's also shorter than traditional short-action cartridges. I'm not quite sold on the utility of the round, plus it's so short and fat it can potentially present feeding issues in some bolt-action rifles. Now, the less-than-enthusiastic rollout of the round due to the Jameson patent dispute certainly didn't help with things. The fact that there was a literal glut of new rounds at the time didn't help either. So just in the span of a couple years from Winchester, we got the 277, 300, and 325 WSM, and the 223, 243, and 25 WSSM cartridges. That's seven new rounds in four years just from Winchester. Plus, on the Remington side of things, you had the 7mm, 300, 338, and 375 rum, along with the 7 and 300 SOM. So that's six more cartridges. That's 13 cartridges in just the course of a couple of years. And that's just from Remington and Winchester. So it's possible that a lot of hunters and shooters, by the time the 25 WSSM came out in 2004, just kind of threw their hands up and said, man, you guys are putting out way too much new stuff. I don't see what the differentiation is between this and the older cartridges. I don't see the need to buy this new cartridge. So they didn't sell a lot of rifles and ammunition in these new Winchester short magnum or super short magnum cartridges. So they stopped supporting them as enthusiastically after a couple of years. And there was even less incentive for other companies to pick up those cartridges too. So the people that bought them at the beginning got put in a tough situation where they bought this new rifle and then had a hard time getting ammo for it after just a few years. That makes things tough on the logistical side. But for those that have one, there's nothing wrong with it. Especially if you hand load, you can do basically everything with your 25 Winchester Super Short Magnum that someone else could do with their longer 25-06. If you have a 25 WSSM, email me, john at thebiggamehuntingblog.com. Let me know what you think about it, what sort of hunts you've been on with it, what it's like getting ammo, all that sort of thing. I'd like to talk to you about it. Okay, let's move on to the final cartridge on this list, the 257 Weatherby Magnum. This was the second Weatherby cartridge behind the 270 Weatherby Magnum. Released in 1944, the 257 was Roy Weatherby's personal favorite cartridge. It was built basically along the same lines as the 7 Rim Mag and the 300 Win Mag. You take a 300 H&H, blow it out, give it the double radius shoulder, and in this case, you neck it down to 257 caliber so that it fits in a standard length rifle action, but gives you just screaming fast velocity. If you're like Ricky Bobby in Talladega Nights and you just want to go fast, then the 257 Weatherby is the cartridge for you. It was the fastest commercial quarter bore when Roy developed it in the 1940s, and it still hangs on to that title today. This was the 25 caliber Magnum for many years. And while, say, the 25-06 and the 25 WSSM are also pretty fast, the 257 Weatherby is still faster. For instance, one of the original 257 Weatherby loads was an 87 grain bullet at 3,825 feet per second. Now, as you'll learn here shortly, sometimes different muzzle velocities get tossed around for this cartridge, but that number I just gave you, 87 grains at 3,825 feet per second, is straight from the book Weatherby, The Man, The Gun, The Legend, talking about the original ballistics of the cartridge way back when it was developed. Now, though Roy initially introduced it to the world in 1944, it did not receive SAMI approval until 1994. And as happens sometimes, especially with some of these other older cartridges we've talked about in this episode, advertised ballistics do sometimes vary and change across time. So here's some of the current loads available for it. Hornady and Weatherby both make 257 Weatherby factory ammo. Hornady makes a load with a 110 grain ELDX at 3,240 feet per second. That's 100 feet per second faster than Hornady's 25-06 load with that same bullet. 
Hornady also makes a loading for the 257 Weatherby with a 90 grain CX at 3,625 feet per second. That is as close to laser flat as you're going to find these days, especially in a factory load from a company like Hornady. With a 200 yard zero, you just need five inches of holdover at 300 yards with that round. Weatherby themselves also make factory loads for the 257 Weatherby. For instance, they have a load with a 100 grain TTSX at 3570, a load with a 90 grain hammer custom bullet at 3700 feet per second. They also make a load with 110 grain ELDX, but their load is advertised at 3400 feet per second, so a little bit faster than the Hornady load. They also make a load with a 100 grain interlock at 3,600 feet per second, a 115 grain ballistic tip at 3,400 feet per second, and a 100 grain swift Sirocco at 3,575 feet per second. So fast, fast, fast cartridge. Everything you liked about the 25-06 Remington, just more. Flatter trajectory, less wind deflection, more retained energy, but more, though not necessarily excessive recoil and muzzle blast. Just like the case is with most of the other Weatherby cartridges, the 257 Weatherby does need a longer barrel for optimal performance and to get all of that velocity out of it. You're looking at a 26 to 28 inch barrel usually here. Sometimes that's a 26 inch barrel with nothing on it. Sometimes it's a 26 inch barrel with a two inch long muzzle brake. On the other hand, say 22 to 24 inch barrels are most common with the 25 odd six. Every now and then you do find one with a 26-inch barrel. The other deal with the 257 Weatherby on the downside is you have more expensive and harder to find ammo. For instance, I looked today. Hornady Precision Hunter ammo is available $47.99 a box for 25 out 6 ammo, $75.99 for 257 Weatherby ammo. Now, Weatherby was the sole provider of rifles and ammo for a long time for this cartridge. Hornady is the only other company I know of at this instant that makes 257 Weatherby ammo. But the good news is, is that Weatherby will always likely support this cartridge. I think the 300 Weatherby is their most popular round right now, and the 257 Weatherby is number two right behind it. Now, Weatherby ammo is expensive, but it is high-performance stuff, and it is known, especially in modern production rifles, that modern production ammo is known for being very accurate as well. And if we're being honest with ourselves here, Weatherby cartridges, Weatherby rifles are not for people that are extremely cost conscious to be polite about it. Part of the thing with Weatherby is their quote unquote cool factor. Not only are many of their rifles just beautiful works of art, but he also did his best to make sure public figures like John Wayne, Roy Rogers, and Chuck Yeager had Weatherby rifles that they hunted with themselves. That also went hand in hand with the eye-popping ballistics of some of these cartridges, and the 257 Weatherby was one of the more noteworthy in that area. Weatherby cartridges were always known for being very fast rounds, and in terms of a big game hunting cartridge, the 257 Weatherby is still about as fast as it gets. Now, sometimes those cartridges produce very fast almost lightning fast kills on game. As impressive as those can be sometimes, those very high velocity impacts are rough on bullets. And the risk of bullet failure increases as you take shorter and shorter range shots as those uh, impact velocities increase, especially if you're using a softer bullet. Now that 100 grain TTSX and that 90 grain hammer are awesome projectiles that can withstand those higher velocity impacts and still just be devastating on game. But that say that ELDX bullet is a wonderful choice for an open country hunt with the 257 Weatherby when you're unlikely to shoot something at very close range and you want that really good energy retention, better performance in the wind, all that sort of stuff. Now I talked about ammo availability in terms of rifles, Weatherby, as far as I know, was always the primary producer of rifles in this chambering. I think Remington did make a few Model 700s in this cartridge over the years. I've also seen just a handful of other random rifles in 257 Weatherby 2, like like Blosser, R93, and um, R8. Um, I'm not sure if those were just one-off custom rechamberings or if they actually made them, but in any case, it, if they did make them, 
they didn't make very many of them. And so if you want to hunt with a 257 Weatherby, a Weatherby rifle of some kind is your best bet. Be that a Vanguard, a Mark V, their new 307, something like that. But like I said, Weatherby has always done a good job of supporting their cartridges in general and this round in particular. So even though Weatherby will be your primary source for a 257 Weatherby rifle, you have a couple of different options from them. In terms of ideal use cases, the 257 Weatherby fits into the same category as the 25-06, but just quote-unquote more so. Antelope? Check. Mule deer? Check. Elk? Sure. That high-velocity round was great for hunters in open country before the days of laser rangefinders when range estimation was sometimes just a guess. If you take just that pedestrian, hornady interlock bullet, for example, with a 300-yard zero, you won't hit more than 3.3 inches above the POI at closer range, and it's hitting only 7.75 inches low at 400 yards. That is fast and flat. A top of the back hold on a deer or antelope is dead meat at 400 yards with that cartridge. I'm not saying you should do that, but that is part of the appeal of a cartridge like this. Plus, even at 400 yards, even that pedestrian 100 grain interlock is still going 2,500 feet per second, and it probably still hits like a hammer. Now, I have to address the elephant in the room, so to speak. The often repeated story that Roy Weatherby killed a Cape Buffalo with his 257 Weatherby Magnum. This is one of those stories that is thrown around so much that it is basically just taken as gospel. Well, in preparation for this episode, I did some research along those lines in an attempt to run down the details of this incident. I approached this from the standpoint of, I'm sure this happened, I just want to know more about it. What country was he hunting in? What year did this incident take place? Where did he shoot the buffalo? Those sort of things. Interestingly, I found very few facts about this alleged incident. I found a lot of people expressing their opinion about it. Most people thought it was in the quote-unquote not a good idea category, which I agree with, but that's not what I was looking for. I wanted to know the details of what happened. The more I looked the more curious I got about the dearth of facts about this incident. I even found some rumors that he killed an elephant with the cartridge too, so I got even more interested in it. Geez, what is the deal with this 257 Weatherby? Everybody's talking about this incident, but nobody is sharing any details. Well, I found one thread on the Africa Hunting Forum, and a guy there mentioned that the details of Weatherby killing this buffalo with the 257 Weatherby were in the book Weatherby, the Man, the Gun, the Legend. So I bought the book and I read it. It is a very interesting and entertaining read, especially if you're a gun nerd like me who likes to learn more about this stuff. The authors talk about all sorts of things relating to Weatherby in this book, but the thing most pertinent to this discussion is the transcription of Roy Weatherby's diary entries from his 1948 Kenya safari. That hunt began on June 7th and ended on July 15th. I thought, perfect, this is where I'm going to find the details of him killing this Cape Buffalo. Well, I read through the entire book, paying especially close attention to the diary entries, and he most certainly does not kill a Cape Buffalo with a 257 Weatherby on that safari, and it does not talk about it anywhere in that book. That was very perplexing to me, especially since it was held out as where you could get those details. Now, funny enough, though, he does shoot a Cape Buffalo with a 257 Weatherby and talks about it in his diary. He didn't kill the Buffalo with a 257 Weatherby, though. Additionally, as I was doing more research along these lines, I found some other interesting tidbits that gave me some ideas about what is going on here. Now, as I'm looking at the clock as I'm recording this, we're already an hour and a half in, and truth be told, I think I could probably record an entire podcast episode about this subject. And that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit pause on that right now, and we're going to pick back up on this subject of Roy Weatherby killing the buffalo with the 257 Weatherby, and we will discuss it in more detail in a couple of weeks. I'm literally about to start an Africa hunting mini series next week, and I will roll this subject about all the things I was going to talk about, about the 257 Weatherby hunting in Africa into that episode, and I'm sure you guys will like it. So please forgive me. 
But come back in a couple of weeks and we'll finish this discussion. But as I wrap up on the 257 Weatherby right now, I will say I'm very skeptical that Roy Weatherby killed a Cape Buffalo with a 257 Weatherby. I know that is bordering on heresy in some circles right now, but I have done some pretty thorough research on this subject and I have not found a primary source that describes him doing that. That said, I am willing to admit that I could be wrong, and if you have any solid information about this alleged incident, I will be happy to hear you out, and if that information pans out, I will happily correct my statement and pass out the right information. This needs to be solid information from a primary source, though, and by that I mean details from someone who is actually there, either from Roy himself, one of his companions, one of his guides, something like that, and I want to know details, where the hunt took place when the hunt took place, what type of bullet he used, all those sort of things. Now, I'm not trying to take off any shine from the 257 Weatherby. I think it is a wonderful choice for all sorts of stuff. I would happily take it deer, antelope, or elk hunting. I would even take it on a plains game hunt in Africa. But I darn sure wouldn't take it Cape Buffalo hunting. Email me, john at thebiggamehuntingblog.com, if you have information about this subject. So as we wrap up with 25 caliber cartridges in general, we have an interesting mix of rounds here. A couple pistol cartridges, a couple rifle cartridges. Browning designed the 25 ACP. We have the 250 Savage from Savage, a couple from Winchester, from Remington, one from Weatherby. You may have noticed there are a couple of dogs not barking here. Nothing from Hornady. There's nothing from Nosler. And no new 25 caliber cartridges at all in the last 20 years. With those things in mind, I'm going to make a bold prediction that we are going to see continued refinement of the 25 caliber bore diameter in the near future. I strongly suspect this will progress along the lines of what we've seen with the 270 caliber in more recent years. For instance, the 270 Winchester, 270 Weatherby, 270 Winchester Short Mag, and the 6.8 Remington SPC were the only 277 caliber SAMI standardized cartridges in common use until very recently. The 6.8 Remington is a smaller round designed for use in an AR-15, while the other three ranged from somewhat common to extremely popular among hunters all over the world. As good as they are and were in many respects, the 270 Winchester, 270 Weatherby, and 270 WSM were hamstrung by that slower 1 in 10 inch rifling twist rate that kept them from being able to use really heavy for caliber high BC bullets. Very similar to what I described earlier with the 25 caliber bore diameter. Now, that was not necessarily a big handicap for most hunters, right? If you're shooting a deer at 100, 200, 300, even really 400 yards, the 270 Winchester, Short Magnum, and Weatherby all worked fine for those things. But the 6.5 millimeter, 7 millimeter, and 30 caliber bore diameters did have more bullet options for those that wanted a higher BC bullet. Well, things changed, though. In 2020, when Nosler released the 27 Nosler with their new high BC 165 grain Acubon long range bullet. Winchester and Browning 6.8 Western followed on the heels of the 27 Nosler the following year. That cartridge also used the 165 grain ABLR. Now, the 270 wasn't really going anywhere in a bad way, but those developments breathed additional life into the 270 caliber as other companies have started producing heavier and higher BC 277 caliber bullets, and you're starting to see 270 rifles being produced with faster rifling twists to stabilize those bullets. Right now, you can buy a Browning X-Bolt with a faster rifling twist rate in the old 270 Winchester, and you can use that 165 grain Acubon long range in it if you so choose. Well, like I detailed with the 257 caliber, You don't have hardly any high BC bullet options right now. In fact, there are even fewer high BC 25 caliber bullet options than there were 277 caliber bullet options before things started changing with that cartridge. I strongly suspect that will change in the next few years. I don't have any inside information here, but I will say I'm starting to see evidence in the marketplace that other people in the industry feel the same way I do. For instance, 
Hornady just released a 257 caliber 134 grain ELD match bullet. BC on that, 0.645. That absolutely blows away Hornady's 110 grain ELDX and 117 grain SST projectiles in the BC department. Just like how the 165 grain Acubon long range presaged the introduction of the 6.8 Western, I think the 134 grain ELD match is an indication we're going to see a 25 Creedmoor or maybe a 25 PRC in the near future. Both of those rounds already exist in the Wildcat space. Of the two, I think the 25 Creedmoor is more likely to appear, at least sooner anyway, than the 25 PRC. We already have a 6.5 Creedmoor, a 6 Creedmoor, and a 22 Creedmoor. 25 Creedmoor is the only one in that family that we're missing right now. So if we see something like a 130 or 132 grain ELDX hit the market here soon as a reloading component, that could be an indication that Hornady is continuing to make developments along that line. And we may see that bullet in conjunction with a new cartridge, or we may see it come out first as a hand loading component. And then in the future, we could see a new cartridge developed to use that bullet. Now, that stuff might not debut in 2025, but I think something along those lines is coming down the pike. Check back with me in a couple of years, and we'll see how that prediction pans out. I could very well be wrong about this, but that is my prediction. I think we're going to see some sort of new 25 caliber cartridge from somebody, maybe Hornady, maybe Nosler, maybe Winchester, who knows, but something along those lines I think is going to come out optimized for high BC bullets. More to follow. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel right now and hit that like button. Just click on that thumbs up button and the red subscribe button below the video to make sure you don't miss out on any of my other new videos about cartridge comparisons, cartridge profiles, ballistic gel tests, and more. Now, I've also put links below the video to articles I have written about some of my favorite pieces of hunting gear, like slings, ear protection, scopes, things like that. And for more detailed information on popular hunting cartridges and what they are best suited for, click the link in the description below or go to huntingguns101.com to get a free ebook I have written on the best hunting calibers. Now I'm going to turn it over to you. Have you hunted with any of these 25 caliber cartridges I just talked about? If so, which one? What game have you successfully taken with them and what ammo and rifle did you use in each case? Let me know by leaving a comment on this video right now. Also, feel free to leave a comment with requests for other cartridge comparisons you would like to see in the future. I have done a couple of other big caliber roll-ups, like on the 270 caliber, 9.3 and 375 caliber and whatnot. Links to those videos are in the description as well if you want to check those out. Thanks for watching, have a great day, and good hunting.